This is mostly a class about development economics, but there's been so much debate about the effects of immigration on the receiving countries, I thought we'd cover that for just a bit. Sometimes observers have the mistaken intuition that because immigration increases the supply of labor, therefore it must lower wages in the receiving country. Let me first show you what that intuition looks like using supply and demand graphs, and then show you a better way to think about the problem. So here we have the labor market, and the vertical axis is wage, and here's the quantity of labor, and we have a downward sloping demand curve for labor, and we have an upward sloping supply curve, and the common intuition is you have more immigration. Well, first here's the wage, and there's the quantity of labor. But the intuition is you have more immigration, you have a new supply curve, which has shifted out, and you have a new wage level, which is lower than the old wage level, and therefore it seems that by increasing the supply of labor, immigration lowers wages. But that's really not how it works. To think of the question in a fuller manner, what's going on at the same time is that immigration is increasing the supply of labor, but it's also increasing the demand for labor. When immigrants come to the United States, they want to buy a lot of things, and of course a lot of immigrants start businesses, such as when Google was started, in part, by an immigrant. So the new market really would look like this. Here is our supply and demand graph with wage on the vertical axis, quantity of labor here. We have a downward sloping demand curve for labor. We have an upward sloping supply curve. It's true the supply curve for labor will shift out, but the demand curve for labor will shift out also. And when you take both shifts into account, well, before, here was the wage level. After both shifts have taken place, we can see that the new wage level, in this case it comes here, it's very slightly higher, but when both curves shift, it's possible that the new wages are higher, the same, or lower, and therefore, as a matter of theory, immigration does not lower wages. That's theory, but what do the data say? Economists do not completely agree on this question, so let's look at a few different views. We're going to start with George Borjas. Borjas is an immigrant himself. He is Cuban-American, but Borjas is generally considered to be an immigration skeptic, especially for low-skilled immigration coming to the United States. This table is adapted from his work. Let's just look at a few of the more important results. First, for native workers in general, in the long run, what does Borjas estimate to be the net effect of immigration? Actually, it is zero. This doesn't mean there are no losers. In the long run, the group which loses the most are high school dropouts. Their wages are 4.8% lower than would have been the case with a lower level of immigration. A group gaining is high school graduates. Their wages are 1.2% higher. And of course, high school graduates are a fairly numerous group. It makes sense that high school dropouts are the most likely losers because a lot of the immigration coming to the United States is relatively unskilled, and these unskilled immigrants are competing against American high school dropouts to some extent. Borjas is taking an economy-wide look at what it means to have to compete against more workers of your given type or given skill level, but there are some important benefits of immigration which are not really captured by this approach. One of these is comparative advantage. Let's say that you are a doctor. You can get better training or work longer hours if you have the ability to trade with immigrants, for instance, the ability to hire immigrants to clean your home or to watch your children. This helps the doctor, of course, but it also helps all of the patients who end up being served by the doctor. Immigration also increases returns to capital and returns to land. So the Borjas estimates are really just about wages, but it's generally accepted that capital owners are better off, and it's often been suggested that the United States should allow in more immigrants to boost its currently struggling real estate market. Finally, as I had mentioned in passing before, a lot of immigrants create new jobs or maybe even new economic sectors altogether. If you look at Silicon Valley, a lot of the new companies there are the result of immigrant entrepreneurship, where the immigrants come from India, China, Russia, and many other places. David Card has studied the wage effects of immigration, and he arrives at results different from those of Borjas. What Card does is compare city by city. 
For instance, the cities which have a lot of immigrants coming to them do not in general have lower wage rates for native-born Americans. Cities with fewer immigrants coming to them do not seem to have higher wage rates for native-born Americans. What Card finds is that, on average, immigration doesn't really have much of an impact on wages at all for native-born Americans. You'll note that in the aggregate, this is actually similar to the conclusion of Borjas that the net long-run impact of immigration on wages for workers as a whole is zero. Giovanni Perry, working with co-authors, has produced some papers arguing that immigrants may on net increase the wages of native-born Americans. Perry makes two good points. First, immigrants often take a lot of jobs where they're not competing against Americans, but those jobs might otherwise end up not being performed at all. Second, Perry compares immigration and offshoring. So the alternative is not always immigration versus an American having a job, but if there were no immigration, it might be the case that American capital would move overseas and invest overseas, and a native-born American wouldn't have had that job anyway in the first case. Perry has argued that by letting in immigrants, you make your country a more important center of economic activity, and this leads to more investment in your country and less offshoring, and on net, this can be a positive wage effect, or at the very least, does not have to be a negative wage effect. There are papers on the net wage impact of immigration on countries besides the United States. There are papers on Israel, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, and the United Kingdom. The general results from these papers indicate that the net wage impact of immigrants is either zero or extremely small. Nonetheless, immigration tends to be a very controversial topic in the public eye. A lot of the disputes really are about culture. Which individuals should we let into our country? What should our country look like? What should be our country's religions, mores, and social practices? Nonetheless, when it comes to these strictly economic issues, there tends to be a broad consensus among most, but not all, economists. And that consensus is that immigration, for the most part, leads to economic benefits and does not have significant negative downward effects on wages of native-born workers. Immigration also tends to benefit innovation and economic growth. To read more on these topics, go to scholar.google.com and you can enter George Borjas Immigration to get to his papers, David Card Immigration, Giovanni Perry Immigration, and a good survey is by Gordon Hansen, The Economic Consequences of the International Migration of Labor.